It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's live stream of a regularly scheduled podcast, Tech on the Rocks. My name is Hillary Brill, and I lead Georgetown's Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. And we are co-hosting today with the Benton Institute, a very important issue on broadband access and a discussion of its report, Broadband Access Now. The Tech on the Rocks, as I mentioned, is regularly scheduled, and you'll want to check it out with our esteemed uh, host, Gigi Son, who is a distinguished fellow here at uh, our institute. Uh, the institute, through its convenings and events, like today's events, promote education and advocacy efforts for issues that are at the intersection of technology and policy, issues that have a positive societal impact or a negative impact, and we need to help find solutions. For solutions, we host action-oriented events and workshops that bring together thought leaders, academics, and policymakers to help find solutions to challenges that we've identified. Today's issue at the forefront of digital policy issues, broadband access. It's a necessity for education and health needs in the pandemic. Without broadband access, efforts towards social mobility, and betterment are rendered meaningless and in fact are pushed backwards as others, as others who are fortunate to have broadband, they're the ones who get to move further ahead. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our host of today's Tech on the Rocks, Gigi Son. She has decades of experience as a leader in technology and policy issues and particularly in broadband access. She is a Benton Institute Fellow and a Georgetown Institute Distinguished Fellow. She's a co-founder and CEO of Public Knowledge and among many other things, she was also a former FCC counselor to Chairman Wheeler. Gigi, thank you for working with us at the Institute. And again, it is my absolute pleasure to pass this along to you for an exciting opportunity to hear about these issues. Thank you, Hillary, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on a special Tech on the Rocks live podcast, what promises to be a compelling discussion of the policies and practices necessary to get everybody in the US online. Now, before we start, I wanna thank the sponsors of this event, who are also my sponsors, uh, the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law, and, so and Policy, and the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. I want to remind the audience, and it's, it's I can't see anybody, but uh, we have actually quite a large audience for what I think is the last uh, tech and communications policy event of 2020, and we will say farewell to 2020, and nobody will miss it. Um, if you have questions, put them in the little box on the bottom that says Q&A, not chat, not participants, but Q&A. And we already have, I think, over a dozen questions that were submitted uh, with the form, which are terrific questions, some of which we will answer uh, during the usual banter that we have today. But if you have any other Q&A, we'll dedicate the last 15 minutes or so to, to audience questions. So let's start. It goes without saying that high-performance, high-speed broadband internet is essential for full participation in American society, our economy, our education and healthcare systems, and our civic life. Yet tens of millions of people across the nation don't have it, and the results are really tragic. Children sitting outside Taco Bell to attend classes, seniors unable to speak with their doctor through telehealth services, families incapable of connecting with friends and loved ones during a pandemic that is now in its 10th month. So how do we close this digital divide? Coming up with a roadmap for doing so is the task that John Sallett, former FCC general counsel and current Benton senior fellow undertook over two years ago, and again late last year, when he wrote not one, but two reports for the Benton Institute. The first report was titled Broadband for America's Future, a vision for the 2020s, and that was published in October, 2019. The second report, which is what we'll be discussing today, was published this past October, and it's called Broadband for America Now. Joining John to talk about the report is a woman who needs no introduction and has the best glasses in the country, not just in Washington, DC, because that's not so hard, right? I've got pretty good glasses too, but in the country, the best glasses. Mignon is former acting FCC chair, former FCC commissioner, and currently a Benton board member and principal of MLC Strategies, LLC. Mignon Clyburn, so happy to have you. 
There's no better advocate for ensuring that everyone, and in particular underserved communities, has affordable access to robust broadband. So welcome to Tech on the Rocks, John and Mignon. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Let's start with John. So in the introduction, I mentioned that you wrote not one, but two reports that lay out a comprehensive roadmap for getting high-speed broadband into every home in the US. But why did you and Benton feel the need to revise the report and change its title? I mean, what's different in this new report? Well, Gigi, first, let me just say thank you to you, to, to Benton, to Georgetown. It's always wonderful to be with Mignon, even though this year it's all been virtual on video and not in person. But uh, I appreciate the chance. So what was the change? In October 2019, we put out a report whose basic notion was this. We had to solve a series of problems to ensure that all Americans had the chance to use high-performance broadband. Now, we didn't think we had all the answers, so we thought, let's take a year and learn. Let's learn some more. Let's see what we think in October 2020. Of course, what we didn't know, what no one knew, was that the world was about to change in a way none of us could ever expect in a way that's horrifying. It's led to so many deaths in America and so much suffering. It also has led to a use of broadband of a kind we had never before seen. Here's just one statistic. In 2019, about 5% of work days were from home, telecommuting is what we used to call it. In the spring, that went up eight times to about 40% of all the hours worked. Going forward, it's not gonna stay at 40, but it's not gonna go down to five. One economist we talked to says it'll be about 20, 20%. In other words, four times more work at home than there was before. And the same story can be told for healthcare, for social services, for engaging with doctors, as I say, healthcare for education. So what we learned was that we shouldn't be talking about broadband in the 2030 range, which is what the title of our first report was. We needed to talk about it now because we now had the proof. And the proof was what the word you used a minute ago, Gigi. Broadband and real broadband, high performance broadband is essential to participate in our democracy and our economy and our society. And so we knew we had to make the issue a now issue, not a decade long issue. That was the fundamental shift that we saw. Did you want to add anything, Mignon? Well, you know, one of the things that um, uh, that drew me to Benton and this report uh, is the fact that it mentions very clearly uh, that all of the problems that are addressed here are, are inherited. <laughs> There is nothing new. And when we talk about the uh, digital divide or, or, or all of these uh, technology canyons and, and, and whatever terms of art we wish to, wish to embrace, uh, it's an age old American challenge. It's the haves and the haves not, have nots. It is really fundamentally us picking win winners and losers. Now, I know a lot of people don't want to hear me say that up front. But what we have said is uh, we're going to build uh, infrastructure in areas where it makes the most economic sense. We have said and have um, done in terms of the FCC, in, in case this we, um, what we have done and said is we're going to concentrate um, the majority of our efforts in uh, creating and building infrastructure in uh, rural areas because that is where the divide is. Newsflash, if you look at the numbers um, where the people that are disconnected truly are, it is more of an urban problem than a rural problem. So the thing is, we can um, uh, speak about, and rightly so, uh, with this program, and thank you for having me, um, uh, uh, about the digital divide and all of these other challenges, but it has as its root uh, the the fundamental choices that we have made that have not been equitable, that have not been inclusive. So why in the world, well, in, in a world of a more connected 21st century, should we think any of the outcomes and the challenges are any different? So you teed up my next- And question. could I just say one thing? Go ahead, go ahead, John. Can I just say one thing? 
what Minion said is fundamental, and it goes to a point that I, 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 I made perhaps too abstractly. We have a tendency to think of the broadband problem as a problem of building networks. And of course, building networks is a part of the solution. But as Minion says, about three times as many people are not using the internet, not using broadband in urban and metro areas than rural. And one of the things about the agenda and work, some work that Minyan and I have done together is we need to solve every aspect of this problem. And that includes and starts with digital equity. So you've, you have also teed up my next question, which is going to go <laughs> quite beautifully. So the report's broken down into four topics, digital equity, deployment, competition, and community anchor institutions. And we'll take each one in turn. Let's start with digital equity, a topic, Mignon, you know really, really well. Can you give the audience a definition of what digital equity is? And how does it differ from digital inclusion? You also talked about inclusion, but people oftentimes don't know the difference. And, and I struggle with that too, honestly. I mean, I, I, you know, let me just be honest, but let me give a, a, an example that you can find in the report. Um, and um, it is so interesting to me that people are marveling over our increased use of uh, technology when it comes to telehealth. You, you know, if you, if you, if you look um, at the report, it talks about how things look, I think it was 2018, when about 18% of us use the type of um, connectivity, um, you know, that would give us the dexterity to not go into a, a professional uh, medical offers. And how, if you were to look at the that today, that number in some places has grown 175, you know, times, you know, what it was uh, back then. But I, when I looked at the report again, just in the early pages, it talks about um, a, uh, a study that the University of Alabama did that, and this sounds phenomenal on the surface, that 40% um, uh, of um, its visits, you know, there were the 40% of the visits, you know, were, were telehealth. Um, but, well, no, there, there, there are a lot of the visits. And I'm so excited. I, I, I didn't make the point succinctly, so let me back up. That 40% of those telehealth visits that have grown so exponentially were made over the telephone or audio versus video. Now, to me, I wanted to go back and straighten up that point because those calls, legacy calls, as opposed to that video interaction that would give you most of the tools and the, the ability for that doctor to look and observe, they took place over the phone because of a lack of technology, a lack of digital literacy, um, you know, a, a, a lack of affordability. And so, yes, I have quote unquote access. So you can say that I am included um, in a 21st century uh, connectivity, but is it equitable? You know, do I have the same or equivalent tools that others who are so connected um, have? Do I have the means? Uh, so it is not just about having um, the ability to click or to call. It is about having the capability and the capacity and the equipment in my home uh, to be able to get the full use of it. That's the difference to me in terms of being included because I can call and speak to my doctor and for it being equitable. And to me, that is about as a solid example in a critical um, you know, experience uh, and critical challenges that I can come up with right there. Um, just because it's there, just because it's built, it has nothing to do with if I can afford it, do, um, do I truly, do I truly have the tools and the capacity needed uh, to take full advantage? Um, is it equitable? It is not. Is, inc is it inclusive? You can make the point, but numbers don't lie. That 40% of those just calling in, that is a telling number. And I think it illustrates uh, the divide in the problem and the difference between the word equity and inclusion. That, that's, that was an amazing example. John, did you want to weigh in? Because I actually have an example that, that I want to tack on to Mignon, but do you have, did you want to weigh in on this? Well, let me just say this. Mignon and I, earlier in the year, 
authored an op-ed in the Boston Globe. And we called upon Congress to consider taking action to deal with the affordability crisis, right? And let's just do a little bit of programmatic discussion. The FCC has the Lifeline program, but everything we know says that's overwhelmingly used for wireless connections. And that's perfectly sensible. Some a mom at work needs to reach a kid somewhere else. But what we've learned in this crisis is that robust broadband connections to the home are also essential. And we need to think about how to make sure that affordability crises do not prevent people from being educated or learning job skills or going to work or seeking health care or anything else that's critical to participation in society. So uh, Mignon and I called upon Congress to think about a way for eligible households, low-income households, to be able to have the means to actually subscribe to a broadband provider for the household to use to cover all of these kinds of needs. And I think that's an important discussion to have. So you call this America's Broadband Credit, or ABC. Yes. So can you talk, uh, either one of you, uh, maybe we can start with Mignon and then John, you can fill in again. What yeah, are the sure. elements of the ABC? And, and John is, is better at the numbers. You, you can see by his background, he is definitely better <laughs> at the numbers. But what I will say mm -hmm. um, is this, it is a recognition uh, that uh, where all of us have fallen short. We have done this incredible job on one side of the coin in terms of the infrastructure uh, challenge and in, 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 uh, investing billions of dollars annually uh, for that infrastructure challenge. But when it comes to the affordability gap and what that means, particularly during a pandemic, what it shows is that money does matter, that money can fix it, that we need to really uh, look at the affordability factor because those Americans who could afford the $60, $70 of monthly service, um, too many of them can't afford it now. Uh, they have lost their jobs. They have, you know, they're, they're, uh, they need to are uh, forced into being reskilled. Um, you know, all you have to do is look at the the news, and you're it's heartbreaking. You turn it off every night because what you see is uh, I, I heard this lady is like I went to college. Um, you know, I was on this incredible track. I I was moving forward, and now I can't feed my kids. So if she can't feed her kids, she can't afford broadband. And so what we looked at is not only is this a necessity, uh, uh, you know, it's an emergency. It is a crisis. And minimally um, $50 a month, you know, a, a credit could really address that. And when you address the affordability factor, think about what that investment means to all of the other needs and challenges that we have in terms of education, healthcare, being connected to government. Because think about what this means, and I'm answering it in a really long way, but it just underscores it, um, you know, Gigi. If I cannot, if my children cannot, in a continual way, um, uh, experience their um, uh, distant learning obligations, if they, if they can't do that, then I'm going to have a rough time applying for or getting access to the government services I need to bridge the gap now. So that investment, uh, the price tag will not be low, but think about what it will open in terms of the doors of opportunities uh, for the future. It is a down payment for a three to four times multiple payoff Every infrastructure challenge that we have um, addressed in this country has come with a three times plus dividend. This is no different, uh, which is why we thought it was so important to, um, to concentrate on that and really say it is an affordability problem. This is an investment we need to make. It is about access to that infrastructure that I know you're enthusiastically building because build it and they will come does not happen if they don't have the dollars needed to connect. So John, I wrote a piece for CNN.com a couple months ago talking about the consensus between advocates yep. like us and industry for this $50 a month, yeah. your ABC, right? Yeah. We haven't yet. We don't have it yet because we haven't yet had Congress engage both houses of Congress 
engage in a real understanding of why broadband is necessary and why it pays the kinds of dividends that Mignon talks about. Now, I should say, and I will say this even though Mignon is the other person on this, that Congressman Clyburn's bill introduced this past summer, which was passed by the House as part of its overall infrastructure effort, is a great starting point because it's comprehensive. It deals with deployment, it deals with digital equity, and it deals with affordability. We, uh, we should just remember the kind of crisis we're in, right? I believe at the time of the last jobs figures, we were down something like 10 million jobs from where we were in February of this year, okay? Moreover, there's statistics now about the number of American families who have fallen into poverty just since this summer. So we've traditionally thought that broadband wasn't so important and that a lot of people could afford it. And now we're in a world where broadband is much more important and fewer people can afford it. And that means we need to take the same spirit to this that we've taken as Mignon says to other infrastructure, right? Think about it just this way. We believe that public education is critical, that the ability of a child to learn should not depend on a family's wealth. That's what public education means. Kids are going to school in their living rooms or kitchens or bedrooms today. They need to be connected, and so do their parents. I just think this is a societal imperative. It's interesting. Uh, I got a couple questions about <clears throat> access to the courts uh, and how low-income people yeah. can't get access to the courts for a variety of reasons uh, because they don't have connectivity. I didn't even think about that, right? I, one question was, what can a court system do to bridge the digital divide to facilitate remote appearances and equal access to justice? So we talk a lot about telehealth and schools, but I didn't even think about that, yes, right? right? I mean, the government does include that. You know, government when you talk about access to government and services is inclusive because we have a tendency. Um, it's so interesting how, and, and, and I guess it's very human for us to, um, you know, use a, a word or a phrase or a, a, a ways of thinking and have that mean one thing. When I say to you government services, you probably went straight, not you necessarily, but a collective you went straight to benefits. Think about uh, you know what you just said in terms of you know court. You know think about all of the other. Um, you, you know right now I we were having some problems. I, I needed to fill out something for um, my um, uh, my certification to be able to do business in. I think it's called a business license. Um, you know, <laughs> and um, there was some things going wrong, and I had to go old school. I don't know if I have my license or not because I have to wait for the postal system. <laughs> so what I'm saying is when you have that breakdown, then I could not seamlessly um, sign up, uh, you know, uh, and, and if I couldn't do it with this connectivity, you know, because of whatever other challenges, just think about others who are not as fortunate. So again, it's, it's very broad um, by not only what it looks like and who it looks like and what the need is, which is growing sadly. But it, it the dividend, we do not, Gigi, do a great job of making the business case and being aware of what the, the dividends are uh, for this. Uh, you know, internationally, they used to call it digital dividends. I really wish America were to adopt uh, that mindset that we have seen in, in other countries talking about the digital dividends. We don't speak about that enough because if we did, this wouldn't even be a debate. That would have been one of the first things that Congress, you know, would have greenlit. Um, and so, you know, this is why it's so important for us to look at not just, you know, pretending that this is for somebody to play a video game or, um, you know, to to uh, it, it enable um, this lap of luxury. Now kids can't learn. And another thing you, you see in, in that report, and yes, Gigi, you know how I am, um, whatever your question was, I'm not going to answer it. Um, but I would, you, you, when, when, you, when you look at what the Quello Center said, there's some very sobering things in this report. The Quello Center looked, and this is pre-COVID, this was March, so we hadn't even hit the crisis level. It talked about a connected home when it comes to students versus a non-connected home. And you know what it said? It was like the equivalent of an eighth grader to an 11th grader. They talked about this, you know, um, this not being connected 
being upwards of a three-year deficiency gap by way of learning and opportunities and access. So if it was, if in March of 2020, if they're right, that report, and you know, that's leading up to when you have a report, today, when we have said minimally, students have lost a year of learning, just think about what that gap will be. Um, with all due respect, uh, when it comes to next um, school cycle, where we don't know right now, we're going back in January. Because where I'm sitting now, the school is literally a school the next block. Now they're saying, you know what, you're not coming. We're not, we can't bring you back before the 20th of, of January. My niece and nephew were only going two days a week in the first place, you know, in terms of, you know, seamless learning to traditional learning. Think about what that means, a connected home, three year gap. This is a crisis um, that we need to face. Um, we can't afford to do what we've always done, traditionally put our head in the saying and saying and said, we're always going to have those on the wrong side of the ec economic divide and we just write it off. That's just the America, you know, that, that's just the way the world is. We can't afford to do that. We can't afford to leave one person disconnected. I want to move on to say about. Uh, about affordability, and, and as you guys both mentioned, it is the majority of the problem, but let's move to deployment. Later on in the program, I wanna talk about, you know, how we get everybody, right? I don't wanna sound corny, but it's gonna take a village to get everybody connected. It's not just gonna be the federal government. We're gonna need the states and locals, we're gonna need philanthropies, we're gonna need industry. Everybody's gonna need to step up. Towards the end, I'd like to talk about how we actually actualize that because I think that's critically important. But let's get to the second area of focus, which is deployment, uh, which is essentially, you know, many, many rural areas and a lot of urban areas too, just lack the network. Uh, or if they have the network, it's, it's painfully slow. So John, what are the report's recommendations for getting broadband infrastructure to those places that have none or have, or underserved? In other words, they're still getting digital subscriber line DSL, for those of you who don't remember what that is, it's basically telephone, copper telephone broadband, if I could say it in the simplest way. So John, what are the report's recommendations for increasing high performance broadband deployment to both rural and urban areas? Well, first we have to understand the importance, right? We have to treat broadband as an essential infrastructure, not a discretionary infrastructure. It's something people need to use. Second, we have to talk about what's really broadband. The FCC now for about five years has used the definition of 25 megs down and three up. So when we did the 2019 report, I was thinking, oh, 25 megs down, that's not enough. But here's what we learned this year based on what we're doing right now. The three megs up isn't enough, right? Imagine four people in a household, couple of children, in school on video, a couple of adults working on video, a three meg connection isn't enough to support that kind of interactive video. We have learned in real terms that what the FCC now calls broadband is not sufficient. And the first thing we need to do is raise that definition so that federal funds are going to networks that are future-proof, and scalable and will meet the demands of people today and tomorrow. That sounds, that sounds sort of rhetorical and, and different numbers could be chosen, but it's absolutely essential because otherwise we do what the FCC has done in the past, which is pay people to build networks like four megs down and one up with federal dollars or 10 down and one up, not even broadband today, certainly not broadband under the usage patterns we have. The next thing we need to do is we need to fund more deployment. And there's a couple of ways we can do this. I think we're gonna talk perhaps later a little bit about open access middle miles, which can increase the bang for the buck. But the fact is we need to connect rural America. The FCC, starting in January, needs to figure out where we are. We don't yet have good maps. We don't know, I think, quite what the effect of the Ardoff auction is gonna be. We have thought that it would cost about $80 billion to connect all of America with robust broadband. Maybe that number is lower a little bit, right? The Ardoff auction is approximately $9 billion. So maybe 
It's less than 80 now, but we've got to know where the problem is and we've got to know how much it's going to cost. And then we need to simply ensure that through federal and state efforts, and we should not leave the states out of this, through federal and state efforts, we get the deployment. But last point, we need to make sure that where there's deployment, there's also the help to people to be able to use the connections. And this is not always obvious. So for example, we've proposed that when the federal government fund a network, in that newly funded network, it must provide a low cost broadband connection for $10 a month. This is separate from other efforts, a $10 connection to low income and a $50 connection to everybody so that we can know that working families and low income families can access this newly built network that federal or go state governmental funds have purchased. So let me just do an acronym alert. Uh, RDOF Sorry. means Rural I'm Digital just... Opportunity Fund. That's fine. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, a reverse auction of um, yes. uh, for money to build in unserved areas in rural America. There's been some criticisms of it, which yes. we don't have to discuss today. Uh, but John, let me just pick up on, uh, you know, on, on the RDOF and then some of the things yes. you were saying, because over the last 10 years, the FCC has spent somewhere in the neighborhood of, I was trying to figure it out, what, $100 billion to build broadband infrastructure in rural America, yet there's still huge swaths of rural Americans yeah. with no access to broadband at any price. And then, of course, there are places that have this 25.3 or less, right, 10.1, which is absurd. Yeah. So what went wrong and how do we fix it? And I don't know, uh, you know, Mignon, if you want to add in after John speaks. Yeah. Well, uh, so look, one of the things we did was we spent money and now we're spending the money at the same time, right? This recent auction had money going to places where within the past decade, the federal government was spending money. So if you build obsolete networks, it's not a good use of funds. You have to come back, you have to spend more money again. It's not efficient government administration. That is a huge problem. And the second problem is we don't know where the problem lies, okay? And then there's a third problem we should think about with deployment. We're used to thinking about connecting houses, and that's important to farmhouses in rural America. But increasingly, agriculture is dependent on broadband, and it's unlikely that there's going to be a cable that we connect up to a combine and the cable goes up and down the field with the combine. Some form of wireless technology is going to be essential. So we have to understand that what's happening in American agriculture means that for rural America, we need to think about fixed broadband, which in cases can be wireless, but also how we get not just to the farm, but to the field. That's an additional challenge, but it's a critical one. So, Mignon, oh, Gigi, go ahead. Yeah, yeah Gigi, um, here is, and in, in, I'm saying this knowing that I've been complicit. We're not funding future proof networks. I could stop talking there. <laughs> you know, that, that is the truth. And what we're going to have to do is heal, heal ourselves. You know, all of us in terms of government, you know, supporting these, uh, cri you know, critical infrastructures. We're spending billions of dollars. We've got great headlines and press releases. Um, but, but look at what, uh, when you talked about, you know, the rural development, you know, fun, when you talk about RDOF, hear what you just said, reminded our, our listeners and viewers. The bid was for unserved blocks. What's the definition of an unserved block? <laughs> You know, um, what about those areas that are partially served? What about those areas where the maps are not adequately um, reflective of, of, of what's going on? Are we truly addressing those issues? And the answer is no. So if um, we can spend all the money in the world for us to go from, you know, 780, 768, whatever it was to you know, the five, the 10, one, the 25, three, and or, or whatever the next series of generations, but we're not future proofing. What we're doing is replowing a lot of ground. That nobody wants to say that. I said it. I am as guilty, but I recognize and I will confess my guilt. 
what we need to do forward is do something about some of the challenges and the problems, you know, that we, um, you know, that we have all in ways have been complicit because we can say we did the best we can, but we all know better. We all know that is not correct. So um, the maps are overstating where the broadband is. You cannot sit here and say that you're okay with the FCC saying what is a served area when it said, and I'm not quoting exactly, uh, that it's a place where you can reasonably serve. Tell me how I'm going to speak to my doctor in a place where you can reasonably serve. When it, how, how do I connect to broadband in a, reason, you know, a place where you can, could reasonably serve? That does not help me today. And to show my pocket of need as serve because you can reasonably serve it whenever you reasonably think you can do so. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, that is not helping anybody. So look, all of us are complicit. There are restrictions um, that we're placed and some of it made sense pre-COVID. Um, you know, um, honestly, I've even heard reports um, in, in, uh, of, of people, of companies, of entities, of local governments being intimidated by incumbents and so a lot of interesting things are not happening. A lot of investment is not being made. A lot of state and local decisions um, when it comes to, because all of this is a compounded game. You, you got to apply uh, to do things you know, with, with state and local authorities. Uh, things are not happening because people are fearful of, 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 of getting um, very powerful incumbents mad. Now, I, I just got a couple of powerful incumbents mad by saying that, but that is the truth. So we need to recognize all of those elements that it will take to connect communities, both in rural communities and urban communities, uh, both in communities, you know, uh, again, where farming is the predominant, you know, that there may be more cows uh, than people or more corn stocks uh, than, than homes. And we need to recognize that in um, densely populated areas with, with older um, infrastructure or housing, that it is very difficult uh, to get competitive options there. So we need to really put it all out on the table because all of these are barriers to connectivity uh, that, uh, in some cases, we are subsidizing um, bad outcomes. That's just the truth. And, and until we confess our sins and, and, and promise to do better when we get out of confessional, um, we're going to have the same conversation <laughs> this time next year. Well, well, let's let's pull on that string because it's come on uh, come up several times on on the role of of the state the states and the local communities, because it's, it's felt to me in the last four years that those entities have been treated like adversaries and not partners. And Inyan, you were a state regulator that, you know, people may have forgotten that you were on the, you know, uh, South Carolina, is it PUC or PSC? I apologize. It's PSC, um, in PSC this, uh, public, serv words. public Service Commission, since we're not doing acronyms. Um, you know, how do we get, you know, what is their role and how do we make them part of the solution as opposed to treating them as part of the problem? We recognize at the hyper local level that there are deficiencies. Um, there are um, issues when it comes to uh, personnel. So um, yes, we do need to streamline the application process that will allow for infrastructure build, but that needs to happen collaboratively. Um, you know, that's where um, the nonprofits Yes, and the companies could help, um, you know, working on streamlining, being um, honestly honest brokers in all of this. You can't come with a, um, you know, a, a insufficient application and then bulldoze your way into, uh, you know, serving and think that's okay. Um, and in some cases, respectfully, when the FCC said, no, we're going to preempt, you know, state and local communities, that's the type of, that's what you have encouraged. That helps no one. State and locals have the capacity to do what the federal government can't. It can tailor make, um, you know, solutions. It can um, do things in an unsiloed way because we are executing federally in a siloed way. So uh, it, it's, it's got the dexterity, it's got the efficiencies. Working together will allow us at the FCC not to have 50 plus state solutions, but allow those 50 states and in, 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 I don't like to use the word territories, but I'm not coming, you know, those, um, you know, American citizens who, who are not on the mainland or in Alaska and Hawaii, allow them uh, to, um, you know, to help 
nurture and grow their communities by way of infrastructure the way the government can't. That's cooperation. This, this you know, giving all the spoils to um, a, an, an entity that single purpose is to, to um, uh, embrace and please their shareholders does not help my community uh, get access to affordable broadband services. So again, I guess I'm on this confessional thing, um, but we need to really call it what it is. Um, and all of this, this lack of cooperation from the federal government, which has, FCC has a state, um, you know, a, a joint board, it has the infrastructure that will enable this. Uh, we're just not using it and, um, and we're paying a, a pretty high price, Gigi. Thanks, Benia. John, I wanna to go to you and we talked about state and locals, but could you also talk about the role of industry itself, philanthropies, consumer sure. advocates? Cause as I said before, the federal government is not gonna solve this by itself. So who do we need yeah. to bring in to, to get this done? And when I say this, I mean both affordability and deployment. Right, and I want to come back to the word this in the following fashion. Too, for too long, we thought that this was building a network. If we define that as the work to be done, then that is fundamentally an engineering problem or a problem of capital formation in engineering. In fact, broadband is a social problem. And the reason that state, and we should emphasize tribal, and local governments can be so effective is that they understand the manifestations of the social problems. They understand what it means if part of a community is connected and part is not connected. Okay, so from that perspective, what we see is local governments around the country thinking about how to get more broadband to people by working in public-private partnerships. We talk about this in both of the reports, this year and last year. Local governments who are looking for interesting ways to do it. Charlottesville, Virginia is such a place. San Francisco is another place. Places where this isn't the gov local governments wanting to do it alone, but wanting to work with private providers. The governments can help clear the way. The private providers can provide capital. They can work together to enhance the ability of people to have choices and to have broadband. There are a lot of different models about this. And Gigi, this goes back to something you said at the beginning. In some sense, we don't have to look for the answers. All across America, there are lots of places where the answers are. What we need to do is to learn from them, embrace them, and provide the support for them to continue. So, to bring it back to just one point, the use of federal and state funds, right? The Pew Charitable Trust has done wonderful work this year, Catherine DeWitt and Anna Reed, telling us about how state policies can further broadband. It's terrific work. But the states can't do it alone. We need a federal government that wants to work with state and local governments, that wants to pool resources to get to better results, not hit one level of government against another. And by the way, if I'm an industry player, I'm more likely to come in to be supportive where there's community buy-in for what I'm doing, where I'm not choosing between different levels of government, but I'm able to work for both with community support. And philanthropic organizations play a critical role in building the ability of local governments, local communities to understand what needs to be done. It has to all be brought together. I'm glad you mentioned tribal because, you know, the American Library Association has estimated that seven of 10 rural tribal residents lack access to fixed high performance broadband. And that's just, those numbers are just like mind bogglingly bad. So Mignon, why, why is this the case? And, and what does the report suggest we do about it? I'll, I'll be quick, uh, more succinct than I've been all- um, uh, We love it, we love more. your passion. We love it, come on. Uh, Mignon seems to have frozen. Uh, I don't know what happened to Mignon. Well, let me just uh, fill in until Mignon gets yeah. in, gets back. Although I'm a poor substitute for Mignon. So in the report, the 2020 report, we published recommendations that were put together by Tracy Morris at Arizona State University and Jeff Blackwell, who a lot of people know from his work at the FCC. 
a tribal agenda. Um, and they talked about the lack of, of broadband and they talked about the problems of getting broadband onto tribal lands. And it, it is critical and in fact, it's stunning how little broadband there is. And they, they offer a set of suggestions, just let me know two of them, but the report has more. One is to have a tribal broadband fund that very specifically supports broadband in Indian country, right? So it's not competing for dollars against other places. It's focused on tribal lands. And then I know Tracy and Jeff feel very strongly about spectrum licensing over tribal lands, having a system that prioritizes the ability uh, of, low, of the tribal governments to use spectrum where in places where wireless may be the very best solution, at least the best short-term solution. Um, and so I do think we need extra emphasis, extra emphasis. And by the way, the work that Tracy has done over the last years is all, all should be reviewed in, 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 as we make these new policies. So this is, so again, Tracy Morris at the American yes. Indian Policy Institute uh, at um, Arizona State Arizona University. State. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. And I'm back. <laughs> yeah. And then Jeffrey Blackwell, um, I don't know what the name of his organization is, but he was the former head of the Office of Native American Policy when Mignon and I were at the FCC. So Mignon, do you have anything to add? You, you froze there. No, well, and, 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 I, and I apologize for uh, my connectivity uh, uh, challenges. I'm sure John mentioned um, that um, there should be a, an active and robust, uh, as, as Tracy, uh, Dr. Morris mentioned, a, you know, a federal interagency working group. I mean, you, you can't do this in silos. Um, there is an issue when it comes to warehousing spectrum. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've got to, you know, acknowledge it, just, you know, because it really um, uh, it, 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 it's a challenge when it comes to uh, deployment of wireless uh, services. Uh, we need to do things and look at what the problems are and address them head on with new funding mechanisms and new licensing platforms. Um, the, the, the tribal broadband fund that I know um, uh, uh, John you know, mentioned, um, it, it, it needs to be in place. Um, and again, it's about really recognizing uh, where the problems are and really not trying to put paint them with a broad brush. We got, we've got real specific problems. We have real specific gaps uh, that we need to address. Um, the people you see behind me at a, at, a, at a younger age would always say to me that there are three of you and we love you all. I question that, but they said they did. Um, but we don't, we, you know, we, we don't treat you the same way for a reason. You have different needs. I might need to coddle one more than the other. I might need to have more attention than one than the other. When it comes to communities of need, especially with tribal that are one, two, and three generations technologically behind the rest of the country, we cannot act like the same um, framework uh, that is enabling the rest of the country is going to work there. We cannot do that. So it's got to be streamlined. It's got to, you know, it's got to be intentional. It, it, it's got to, um, uh, you know, it, it's got to be, uh, we've got to fix the, the problem that's glaring. Um, and it doesn't happen doing the same old, uh, you know, execution of um, duties. So John, I want to make sure we touch on the last two areas of focus uh, in the report because we are, we, this has been such a great conversation and we are running low on time. So the first is an area that you know and love, which is competition. And I was hoping that you could walk us through the state of broadband competition in the US briefly. And why has it gotten so bad and what can we do about it? And maybe touch, you talked about open access middle mile networks, which I think is really gonna be one of the keys to getting a more robust competition for broadband in the US. Maybe you could touch upon what those are uh, and, uh, and um, sure. are there models of successful? I think you've mentioned a couple of successful yeah. models around the country. Go ahead. Of course. Let's just start with the numbers. Now, we've got to start with the FCC numbers, and they're bad numbers in the following sense. They systematically overstate the presence of broadband, for the, and Mignon talked about this earlier. But even by these numbers, let's take a typical... Let's take a typical cable speed, 100 megs down, 10 up. I'm sorry if that's an anacronym, Gigi, but it, <laughs> right? that's what a cable system can provide. At that speed, 
about 80% of American households have either a monopoly or in a monopoly where they have no choice, just one provider, or a duopoly, which is very limited choice, two providers. That's not competition. That's not competition the way, for example, the antitrust agencies would think about mergers, right? They, and so it's a competition problem. Part of it is, frankly, because old style DSL is no longer an effective substitute for cable. And look, cable has invested a lot of money, built very strong networks. It's a wonderful thing. So the question is, how do we introduce more competition? Here's two ways we can do it. One is about 30% of all Americans live in multi-tenant environments. Think apartment buildings. And people who live in apartment buildings tend to be lower income than people who live in other places. So when they can't exercise choice because of the decision of an apartment building or a manager, that's a competition problem. Secondly, open access middle mouth. Here's a simple, think of it this way. Networks have peering points and then they get to homes, but they don't do that in one seamless way. So getting from a big peering point into a town, into a neighborhood, is, is a middle mile. And then local providers can build from that location, say it's a school, to the houses around it. When you bring fiber to a school and local providers can use it, it dramatically cuts the cost of deployment. One of the reasons this should be on the policy agenda, that is to say open access middle miles, is because they can be networks that serve an important use, like governmental functions, schools, libraries, hospitals, and then also provide a basis for more broadband deployment. And that's a very good proposition. Mignon, anything you want to add on that? Okay, then let's move to the, the, the final topic, which is community anchor institutions. So John, uh, for the uninitiated, Tell us what community anchor institutions are and why they're so important for closing the digital divide. Well, think of, this is not all of them, but think of schools and libraries and hospitals and then governmental buildings. Well, they're very important, first of all, because they provide services everybody needs, right? Just think of schools. We used to think of E-rate, which is, I'll try to do your job, which is the program by which the federal government provides funds to construction to schools and libraries. We used to think of E-rate in terms of buildings. We need to connect classrooms. But if this crisis has shown anything, it's that we need to connect people, not buildings. In other words, we don't talk about schools, or we shouldn't just talk about school buildings. We should talk about school children, or people who need health care, or people who need job training or to go to work. So community anchor institutions can play a, two, a dual role. First, they need big connectivity, because people will be returning to those institutions. But secondly, they need the support to be able to deploy connectivity to their users, whether, wherever their users are. For example, the Colorado Attorney General, Phil Weiser, for whom I should say I do some work, filed an emergency petition with the FCC saying, gosh, if classrooms are closed, if schools are closed, if children can't get to school, E-rate ought to pay for home connections. There is no classroom except the home in those circumstances. That needs to be done. There's a lot that the Federal Communications Commission can do with the Universal Service Fund, but those needs need to be understood as reaching people wherever they are. Yeah. And Gigi, I, on that point, yeah, you, know, please. you probably know that those in the uh, library um, universe are, are talking about, uh, you know, their systems being closed. And what can they, if anything, do with that excess capacity? It's being paid for. Um, it is sitting idle. Uh, there might be some statutory challenges when it comes to the FCC, but all of these things need to be on a table. These are not normal times. And when we go back to whatever we return to, a more open society, it won't be ever normal again. So when we, we need to do certain things um, uh, in an unsiloed way to address what the critical needs are. And then 
uh, as we move out of this crisis, because we will move out of it or beyond it, we need to figure out the lessons that have been learned by what we have done in a times of emergency, the waivers that we have put in place to see if they have informed us when it comes to future policy. The FCC and other agencies responsible for infrastructure, communications infrastructure, should never go back to what it was before March of 2020. Yep, we're not going back to 2019. And I, and I have to say, I think is an I don't think the statutory challenges are that are that hard. I'm because, just you know yeah. telling you what, what was said. Yeah. I will I will give the person right or wrong the issues. If there's a statutory challenge, I think there are ways in place, mechanisms in place for I'm not the lawyer, you two are to change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, and we shouldn't have to wait until the next crisis to do so. That's an excellent point, Mignon. I want to, I know John's going to have to jump soon. Yeah. So why don't, I just want to ask you, John, uh, yeah. a question. And Mignon, if you want to answer it as well, you can. And then I think we'll close. And I did answer some of the questions that were submitted uh, in my Q&A to you. So I won't be taking any more. What are the prospects? A lot of these recommendations, number one, you know, a lot of them, are terrific. A lot of them are actually not new, and they're a compilation of, of thinking from people from industry and public interest and government over the years. So these are a lot of these are very tried and true. Uh, well, they haven't been tried, they're true, but they have been right. tried. That's what true. are the prospects for getting some of these recommendations actually enacted into law and policy? And um, what do you? Th which ones do you think actually have the best chance? I mean, there's a lot here, and I hope people will read the report, and we will send around the report, and also, you know, some other uh, reference materials uh, after this is over in the next couple of days. What's got the best chance, and uh, what are the prospects? So, we have to solve lots of problems. That can be make it harder because we have to get more pieces in place. But it could also make it easier. So I want to take the optimistic approach. We have a world where rural America needs broadband. We have a world where urban America needs broadband. We have a world in which people who are working anywhere in the country need broadband. We are in a world where low-income people need broadband. We have a world in which communities of color are being hit very hard. The optimistic view is to think that the new Congress, looking at this as a national challenge, understands a very simple point. Enactment of a national broadband agenda, agenda can be a winner for everybody. And if that's the view they take, then I think really we can get the kind of broad program that Congressman Clyburn laid out last this year, we could get that enacted because there's something in it for all parts of America. Mignon, any closing thoughts, either reaction to John or anything else you want to say uh, to close us out? So my challenge to all of us is to not get paralyzed by the long list of challenges that we have. Good point. Great point. Yep. That's what right. we're speaking of here just in the FCC's universe, which is very significant, is that we have an opportunity to make a handful of policy changes that will magnify and amplify positive solutions to that long laundry list of problems that in the past we've allowed to paralyze us. So the challenge with industry, with government, and particularly the agency I love the most, the FCC, to do is to do better, is to work more collaboratively in order to go back to that uh, refrain that I talk about, our, our, our regulatory biblical principles of connecting America. Thank you. Wow, that is a fantastic way to end. Thank you again, John and Mignon. This was Thank you. this was a terrific hour. I hope people will re read the report and we will send it around. Thank you. I want to again thank the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society and the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law and Policy for sponsoring this event and sponsoring me. And I wish all of you out in the audience uh, a very safe and relaxing holiday season. Uh, please be safe. Please wear your masks. And uh, Tech on the Rocks will be back next year. Thank you all. Thank you, Gigi. Thank you, Gigi.